Good morning, everybody, and welcome, welcome to our winter 2021 Saturday morning physics series and today's live lecture by Dr. Maria Elidiana. I'm physics professor Tim Chupp, and I'm organizing this winter's lecture series with Professor Roy Clark. We want to thank you for your support of Saturday morning physics, joining us for these online lectures, and looking forward to your support of Saturday morning physics, joining us in person, hopefully next fall, with bagels and coffee and science. If you would like to explore financial support for our program, please go to our website or search UMISH Saturday Morning Physics. I want to let everyone know that after the lecture, Dr. Elidiana will answer your questions, questions that you submit during the lecture or discussion. Please email your questions to physics at umich.edu. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Elidiana, who is a postdoctoral research fellow here at the University of Michigan and a member of the Dark Energy Survey, which she will tell us about today. Her research focuses on observational cosmology, gravitational lensing, gravity clusters, and gravitational waves. Maria grew up in Brazil and did her undergraduate work from the Rio de Janeiro State University, completing her Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Education degrees in physics. She then moved to graduate study at the Brazilian Center for Research in Physics in Rio, uh, working on using starlight to measure the masses of galaxies. Maria completed the Master of Science degree and her PhD in 2017, and then she came to the University of Michigan last fall after two years at Brandeis University. She's been in her apartment ever since arriving in the fall. Maria is a member of the American Physical Society, the LSST, that Dark Energy Survey Collaboration, the Cosmic Explorer Consortium, and the SNOMAS 2021 Early Career Survey Initiative. She's also a Mu University of Michigan Museum of Natural History Science Communication Fellow. Thank you, Maria, for kicking off this winter Saturday morning physics series, and we're really looking forward to your lecture, Maria. Thank you, team. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here, and good morning for everybody who's listened to me. So today uh, I will talk about uh, these giants in the sky that are the galaxy clusters. As you can see from my spoiler image here, where you have different uh, same galaxy clusters. But one thing we can do with them is to count them and weigh in them. But the problem is galaxy clusters, they are on the sky. We cannot touch them. Then how can we, uh, how can we Me measure the mass or weighing those objects. And that's what we are learning today. So my talk is divided in four, and four main sections. First, I will give an introduction about my research area, which is cosmology. Then I will talk a bit more about the galaxy clusters, how can we weigh them. And for this, we will be using the gravitational lensing effect that I will explain. And, and why do we need to count them to understand better the universe? And this is just a nice image from the Dark End Survey when, uh, where some of my colleagues made uh, uh, some art for it. Okay, so I think one of the questions that some people may once have thinking about is where did you came from? And, It, this is a very, very difficult question. If you come back in the years, in the societies from different cultures, many people have different explanations uh, to explain the, the universe that is around us. And here I have just some representations of different cultures and how they explain the universe they see. And here just to show to you, this is a what we call a Nebra disk. And this was found in Germany and it was produced 2000 years ago. 
And this is a representation of the sun and the moon and some stars. And then some years later in the ancient Egypt, we start to have this representation of gods and godness that represent uh, the natural process that they see, like the sunrise and sunset. We have a godness here representing the sky and another one representing the earth. And, and this keep going, this, try, this kind of explanations about the universe. We have uh, in the ancient China, we have this model here where this circle is the sky, this disc here is the sky, and this uh, square is the earth. At that time, they thought the, the, the earth was flat. So, and more recently in the 17th century, we have a representation here where we have the sun as the center of our universe. Another interesting uh, interpretation about uh, this question, where it came from, what we have around us, it's from this representation from the some native uh, people in South America, where we have the sun and the moon and they are twin gods, and each one is uh, is responsible for different features in the nature, features and patterns on on the nature, like like in this. Uh, on the left here, you see things more like um, open lines that you can identify in the nature. And in this other one, you have just closed uh, uh, shapes that is associated to the moon. So there are many more other representations of the origin of the universe. It, it's a very interesting topic if you want to look more and learn more. but what happened is that at some point we start to have uh, the development of devices and this and and some um in the telescopes and all kinds of uh scientific uh devices that help us to understand better what's going on out there and by using these telescopes and look even further in the sky we start to collect the light and put together the data and try to understand better by uh, observing and making theories and testing the, these theories of how the universe works. And here is just a summary uh, image that show the current model that we have for the universe. Basically this model explains how the things start and how the universe evolved. And I will not go into the, into the details of each one of these phases because there is a previous lecture. You can search, for example, a lecture from Pro Professor Dragon Hooter, who ex explained well this model uh, for us. So you can have a look at that video. But I will just bring you to attention to important phases here in this model. The first one is the very beginning that we call the Big Bang. This is a name to, this is what not explosion, as you might know, but it was the beginning of the universe in a, in, not in a point, but it was the beginning of everything, space and time. And you cannot say anything because you cannot probe or look with observation to that time, t equals zero. So you just have assumptions or models for that, for the time. But a, a fraction of seconds after the, big, after the Big Bang, we start to, to have information about how the universe works. Because although it was uh, very dense and with high temperatures, a very small region, the universe started to expand. And when they start to expand, it, it was very fast, this, uh, this phase of expansion. And we call this phase uh, inflation. And in that phase, we have the seeds, uh, like the small fluctuations that gave origin to the bigger and bigger uh, structures that you see now in the universe. So, but at the time, the region and the space was so dense that even the light could not uh, pass through the matter. Only 380 years after the Big Bang, the light start to separate from the matter. And then we, you first have, you have the first, what we call the first light of the universe, which is a, a remain light from this beginning of our, our universe. 
and that we call the cosmic microwave background. So, and then after 20 millions of years after the Big Bang, we start to have the formation of the first stars and the first galaxies. And that's, that's a very important uh, phase in the universe because uh, there we just have, you know, galaxies, clusters, matter evolving with the, with the gravity and up to the time that we are right now, uh, circa uh, 3, 13 billion years after the Big Bang. And we can see here the universe today is formed by galaxies, galaxy, galaxy clusters. And you can think galaxy is a collection as a collection of stars. And galaxy cluster is a collection of galaxies, as you can see here in this picture. And we just live in a in one of these not special galaxies in a galaxy cluster that we call the Milky Way. And we are here just in one arm of this galaxy or solar system is there. And we are the third planet orbiting the one star that we call the sun. So this is just a brief history of the universe. And this just represents uh, the best model that we have so far based on the observations that you have uh, from, the, from, the, from the universe that represents our knowledge of how the universe began and how it evolved. So this is what cosmology does. It's to study the origin, the composition, structure, and evolution of, of the things in the universe. And this model that I just mentioned to you is called Lambda CDM, but you just can you just can talk this as the Big Bang model if you want. And it's the standard model of the cosmology today. That means that most of most people accept that. But there are other models, but I will not talk about those uh, today. Once and one good thing about the, the Lambda CDM and what made this model um, the concordance model is that it can not only explain the observation that you have, but also can make predictions that can be tested. And this is shown in this in this video where we have two different universes, two different simulations of universe. On the left you have the Lambda CDM, and on the right you have another another universe. And as you can see, the structures here, this is, is basically particles evolving in a box that become bigger structures like galaxies and galaxy clusters. And as you can see, there is a slightly difference uh, on how these, uh, the matter here in each one of these universe evolve and agglom agglomerates together. So that's the importance of having a model that gives some prediction on, on how the model of the matter we, we evolved. And then we can look to observations and see if our model fits one or the other universe. By the way, the, the universe on, on the right was discarded because it do not fit the observation that we have. Another important uh, point about the universe is to understand the content that we have today. And there are basically three components of the universe today. The first one is what we call the conventional, conventional matter. It's, this is the stuff that I am made of, you are made of, stars and galaxies are made of. Everything that you know, it's made of this conventional matter. But this is, the, uh, this is only 5% of the content of the universe, of the total content. Most of the matter is in the form of some mysterious, kind of invisible uh, matter that we call dark matter. But how do we know, if you cannot see, how do we know this dark matter exists? We know because we look to the, the movements of stars in galaxies or the movement of uh, galaxies in galaxy clusters. And from these uh, observations, we see that we need to have more matter in the in those objects to explain the movement the movements that we see and that's why we say that we need dark matter and if you know that what dark matter is you we will certainly win a nobel prize because no physicists know yet what dark matter is and from the previous slide i just mentioned to you that 
we have this um, evolution of galaxies and galaxy clusters with gravity over the time, but this is just half of the history. We would expect that at some point, the gravity will win this expansion of the universe and things will start to get together. But what we see with the observations that this is not happening. What's happening is that the galaxies are moving away from each other. That would mean that we need a force that's different from gravity that puts things together, is putting the things uh, far, far away from each other. So it's a repulsive force. And we, we name this kind of force dark energy. We also have no idea what dark energy is, but as I say, from the observations, we know that it should, it must be there. We just don't know exactly what it is. And this is again, is a Nobel Prize question. If you know, you get the Nobel Prize. So basically this is the content of the universe. Dark energy and dark matter made more than 95% of the content of the universe. And you have no idea what they are. But one thing that we can try to do is try to answer these questions and make questions to try to get closer to the answer of what is dark energy? Is really responsible for the uh, accelerated expansion of the universe? What's dark matter? What's the properties of dark matter? And as a physicist, we create models. And the good thing about models is that we have parameters that we can measure. Parameters are like quantities that if you move or uh, change a bit the value, we will have different universe. And in this case here, there are two main parameters in cosmology that you, we are trying to measure, measuring today. The first one is the, the rate of the expansion of the universe that we call the Hubble parameter or H naught. And here in this plot, I have uh, several measurements for this uh, parameter. But the, as you can see here, we have two bridges. This first bridge represents the measurements that we get from the early universe. And this other bridge, there are the measurements that we have from the late universe, from today, right? And as you can see, there is a gap. Those measurements do not match. So what's going on in there? That's a question that physicists are, and cosmologists are doing right now and trying to answer. Another parameter that is that we have interest is the what we call the SH. You don't need to understand what SH is, but you just need to understand the effect that this parameter has in your model of the universe. Basically, this parameter gives us some idea on how the matter gets together, how the structures uh, grow together to bigger and bigger structures. And he, in this plot, we have two different values of SH for two different universe. If you have a low value of SH, like 0 0.8, we have this configuration here. These uh, red, yellowish uh, dots here are the largest, largest structure that you see in the universe, the galaxy clusters, for example. But if you have a value of SH that higher, in this case, 1.3, as you can see, we have even bigger galaxy clusters are formed here. And we have more regions where we have less matter, these blue regions here. So if you compare those two um, image of this different universe, you can say that this, this one on the right is less homogeneous than the one on the left. And that by measuring this value of SA8, we can determine from, from the from observations and compare with these two projections to see which one is the, the right one. And as I will explain later, uh, this parameter S8, it's really related to the, the number of clusters that we see in the sky. So here just is just a, a summary of the different measurements from the S8 quantity that we have made from different surveys, uh, different astronomical pro uh, projects that look to the sky and measure this quantity in, in different ways. But basically just have to pay attention here that all these points here are measurements of the late universe. Only the magenta ones are the measurements from the early universe, from the CMB. And as you can see, it looks like the late 
uh, late time measurements seems to be a bit lower than the value from, from the CMB. If this is true, if those measurements are different from early in the, from the late universe, it might mean that we have some new physics that we do not understand and we need to, uh, to find out to understand our universe. But I don't want to be the boring person here, but it's probably more likely that we are not measuring well those quantities. But uh, in the language of physics, we say that probably those measurements are facing some kind of systematic. So, but I will explain what is this systematic errors that I just mentioned. So when you go to the lab and you do any kind of measurements, we, you, you have an uh, average value and you have uh, an error in your estimate of that value. And there are two sorts of errors. The first one is the, what we call statistical error. And this is a random error that happens by chance. Uh, and as you can see here in this diagram, these are different measurements that because something happened while you are doing your measurement, something random, you have different measurements every time that you do your measurement. So this is a, a random error. But what you can do to, to remove, or at least to take into account this statistical error, is to measure your, uh, your, your quantity more and more. That means you have more and more samples to perform your measurements. So when you increase the number of samples that you measure, then you start to be, to have, you still have some spread around, but you start to get closer to the center of this picture. So to solve problems with statistical error, you just have to do more me measurements. But the other kind of error that we call systematic is the error that is not random. It's something related to the design of your experiment, the collection of your data, some assum wrong assumption that you have in your analysis. And this you cannot eliminate, but the only thing that you can do is to correct. And here's the representation of a systematic error. So we know the true value must be here in the center of this figure, but you measure then with a low scatter, but uh, far away from the true value that we, sh we should have. So what cosmologists and physicists want to do is try to understand all the possible kind of uh, things that, are, that have influence in your measurements that, uh, that make your measurements go far away from the truth. So we try to bring those points here to the center to, have, to get as close as possible from the, the true value that we have. So that's why systematic errors are very important for cosmology. Okay, now we can talk a bit more about the galaxy clusters, the properties of the galaxy clusters. They are big, of course, they have 10 to the 14 solar mass and they have a size of two to 10 megaparsecs. Okay, these are weird units, but I put here in the metric system, one solar mass is around 10 to the 13 kilograms. That means one followed by 30 zeros. And one megaparsec is, is of the order of 10 to the 22. This is one followed by 22 zeros. So I have no idea how big it is. I just know it's big, it's big, but I cannot imagine how big it is. But if that makes sense for you, one solar mass has, a, has the same mass of 300 33,000 Earths. And this megaparsec unit is equivalent to you go to the center of the Earth and walk around 100 trillion of, of times around the Earth. So uh, yeah, it's a big, it's a large distance, right? So, but this is just about the dimensions of the galaxy clusters. They are formed mostly by red galaxies, as you can see here in this picture. Most of the points here are kind of reddish. And those are elliptical galaxies. They are galaxies that are not forming star an anymore. And there is also extremely hot gas inside the galaxy cluster. And, but this is all visible matter. 
okay, you can see the stars, the gas we can detect in different ways, but the majority of the matter in the galaxy clusters, 8% of the matter of the galaxy cluster is made up dark matter. So that matter that we cannot detect with our devices or telescopes or detectors. Because this is a very extreme environment with you know, gas, stars, dark matter, gravity, all evolving together. This, the galaxy, cluster, galaxy clusters are very important to study astrophysics, different process, but they are also important for cosmology. As I, as I mentioned to you, then if I know the number of galaxy, galaxy clusters that we have in the sky, we can, have, we can infer a value for that parameter as eight. And that's why it's important to count, not only measure the mass, but count those galaxy clusters. But the first thing, when we look to the sky, we just see a bunch of galaxies. How can we then identify a galaxy cluster? A galaxy cluster? There are two ways that we can do that. The first one, we can, as I just mentioned, most of the galaxy clusters are made up of red galaxies. So if I look to the sky and see an agglomeration of red galaxies, it's most likely that I'm looking to a galaxy cluster. So this is a one way to identify galaxy clusters in the sky. Another way is not take into account the color, but just look to the, all the density of galaxies in, in, in the sky, in the plane like here, and try to find these regions here where we have some over densities of, of galaxies. And these would be all galaxy clusters. There are different techniques to try to find out these over densities. And in this case here is just a mathematical technique, technique called the Voronoi tessellation. So, but just think, look to the sky, see our over density of points or of galaxies, then it's a galaxy cluster. Another thing that is very important is to get the distance to those galaxy clusters. And the distance in this, uh, for galaxy clusters is what we call the redshift. And this concept of redshift is very close to another concept in physics that is named the Do Doppler effect. And if you have seen the Big Bang Theory, I guess you should know what it is. But if you don't remember, I will just play a bit this video. Sheldon, there's something I want to talk to you about before we go to the party. I don't care if anybody gets it. I'm going as the Doppler effect. <laughs> no, it's not. If I have to, I can demonstrate. <laughs> I hate what Sheldon's supposed to be. Oh, he's the Doppler effect. Yes. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. Oh, sure, I see it. Now the Doppler effect. All right, I got a shower. You guys, um... See? People get it. <laughs> see? You get it, right? <laughs> okay, let's try to wrap up this information. So he say that the Doppler effect is the change in the frequency between a source who is moving from an uh, from observer. But if you can look here, this is the example he did of pretending to be an ambulance, right? That go that goes closer to someone when this ambulance go in our direction. That means that the frequency of this uh, of the sound that you hear, uh, the frequency it is higher. In consequence, the, the wavelength of this sound A, it is smaller, as you can see here. Lambda is the wavelength of this wave. And, and then we, we can, here we, we hear a, a higher pitch. But if the ambulance is moving away from us, the, the frequency is lower. Uh, and then we have a, a higher well, wavelength. So the wavelength increase. This is true for uh, sound waves, but it's also true for luminous waves. Like for example, here you have some uh, luminous source that is going to our, towards Earth, towards Earth, and then what we see is that the the light of that object go to the region of the spectra that is more blue, and if the source is moving far uh, far away from us it means that the light of that source 
is going to the red region of the, the spectrum. And as you can see, the difference is the size of the wavelength, right? And by measuring uh, how much the, the wavelength change from, from what you measure, for example, in the lab, we can determine how distant this object is. So that's how we get uh, this Doppler effect, this deviation, this shift, this Doppler shift. But for cosmology, for galaxies and objects that are moving away from each other, the cause of the, the, the shift in the frequency is not the movement itself. The galaxies are there, you know, just stop at the space. But the space itself, it's moving, it's expanding. The universe is itself, it's expanding. And that's what caused this change in the frequency of, of the wave. Hey, Sheldon, there's something I want to talk to you about before we go to the party. So I just show another experiment that show this, uh, this change in the wavelength of the, of, of the wave that's due to the expansion of the universe. This is a demonstration used to explain the red shift due to cosmic expansion. We have a vacuum cleaner that's going to be pumping air into a balloon. And on the balloon, we have painted a sine wave that we are going to see grow as the balloon itself grows. This is equivalent to what happens to light as it stretches due to the cosmic expansion. So yeah, that uh, is just a, a demonstration of the what we call the cosmological redshift. That's the kind of redshift that you we measure uh, for galaxies and galaxy clusters. But the only thing that you can get from a galaxy is the light. So how do we measure the, the redshift, right? The, this change in, in the wavelength. So what happens that when we take the, the light, we can decompose that light in a spectra, and as you can see here in this picture. And the important thing is that the spectra has emission and absorption lines uh, from characteristic elements that we have in nature. And we know the position of these lines, these spectral lines in the lab here on Earth, we can measure that. And then as the galaxies move this away from us, this, uh, this line will move to the red part of the spectra. And by measuring the difference from what you measure here, the wavelength that you measure here in the lab with the wavelength uh, that we measure uh, when the, the galaxy is moving away from us, this difference just made made it possible to compute this quantity that we call Z here. I can. So, and this quantity Z is what we call the redshift. So uh, as more, we are at redshift zero here at Earth in the lab. And as it goes to redshift one, we are looking to more distant objects. Redshift one, two, three. So that's a me measurement of the distance. And that's how we get, if you get the, the redshift for galaxy, we of course can also get the redshift uh, for galaxy clusters. But this technique of get the spectra of the galaxies that we see in the sky, it's very expensive because we need to put a special device that we call um, optical fiber to, uh, to get the light for a long time of that galaxy. And there is a limitation in your telescope. You cannot plug infinity, uh, infinity number of fibers there to get the light for each galaxy that you see. 
Uh, so therefore, this technique, it's, uh, although it's very precise, it's very expensive. And we would just be able to get few redshifts, so few distance. The way that astronomers find to, to go around this is to create this technique that's called photometric redshift. In this technique, instead of you know, getting the light, what you do is use different filters uh, represented by these curves here. Each one of these curves here is a different filter that can uh, measure the light at different wavelengths here. So as many, uh, we need to have a lot of filters to be able to cover the entire wavelength range. But as you can see here, with this red curve representing uh, a spectra of, a, of galaxies that are moving away from us, so it's being redshift, you can see the absorption and emission lights will fall at different filters. So we want to keep uh, all this information uh, where these lines are. That's why you need different filters. And then again, we have some model of how this spectra should be for different filters. And then we compare the observation that you have with this model, and we get the estimate of the distance. So we get the Z. This technique, it's uh, with this technique, we can have many galaxies, many, many galaxies. And it's less precise because you're not getting all the light of the object in the sky. But it's much more cheaper. Uh, so that, that's what astronomers use to measure the distance uh, to up to galaxies and galaxy clusters. Okay, now let's summarize. We know what galaxy clusters are. We know how to measure the distance up to them. Now we need to weigh them. So how do we weight a galaxy cluster if you cannot touch them, right? So, and the answer to this question is here in this figure. It does represent uh, what we call the gravitational lensing effect. So basically the idea behind this is that we as observers here at Earth point our telescopes to a very distant galaxy in the sky. And if there was nothing between us and the, this galaxy, the, the light of that galaxy will arrive to us just like a, a, as a straight line, right? But we can put a galaxy galaxy cluster here. And what happens is because of the strong gravitational field of this galaxy cluster, the light of that background galaxy is uh, deflected. And as a consequence of this deflection, what we see in the telescopes is as showing here is these arcs that we call the gravitational arcs. So basically this is the image of this background galaxy distorted. And because in this case we have Earth, the galaxy cluster, it also could be a very massive galaxy, and the background galaxies, they are aligned, we have this uh, strong effect, then we call this strong lensing. But this is very rare, and what, it, what you measure most is not this kind of effect, but it's just a slight light change, very, very tiny change in the shape of the background galaxy. We cannot see in, uh, in the telescopes by eye this change. What you can do is measure, uh, a, uh, measure a lot of uh, shapes to get some signal of this lensing effect. And this is represented here, what you have, you know, random gal background galaxy, and then we put a, len a lens, a uh, galaxy cluster uh, in the front of it. And we have some slightly change in the, in the, the shape of this background galaxy. Uh, here is very exaggerated, but uh, we cannot see by eye. We you need to measure statistically. One way that you, but one way that you you can play around with the gravitational lensing effect is just showing here. You can get a uh, wine of glass, and if you look to the bottom part of it, and you pass this glass for some image of galaxies and stars, you can see that how distorted that objects are here. So instead of being like a circle, they become more elliptical. And this is just a uh, same thing, the same thing happened in the sky. And what it's 
very important about the gravitational lensing is that it's not sensitive to just the matter that we see, the galaxy cluster members, but it's also sensitive to the dark matter inside the, the galaxy cluster. So as you can see here, we have in this GIF a representation of background galaxies, and if there are no clusters, they just follow this blue, blue line here. But then we put a cluster that is also formed by some dark matter, so this much, uh, green, uh, gray halo around this galaxy. And what happens is that the light uh, deflected, the light is deflected, and as a consequence, what we see in the image is this distortion of the of the background galaxy. And as more massive is your galaxy cluster, more lensing we you have more distortion. So by measuring the distortion, we can then infer how was the mass of the of the galaxy cluster that were uh, that was in the foreign ground of those background galaxies. And basically that that's that's the mystery. That's how we use the light of background galaxies to get uh, estimate mass for the galaxy clusters. One funny thing, or maybe a curiosity, is that the, the gravitational lensing effect was confirmed in a solar eclipse in 1990 uh, in, in two places. There was one the experiment in Africa, but also they sent some other experiment to Brazil, to this small city called Sobral which by the way is very close where I was born in Brazil. <laughs> so just saying. And in, at that time, there are this big debate uh, on the how, wh what should be the value of the deflection angle of the light due to the gravitational lensing effect. So the Newtonian, Newtonian uh, prediction uh, has a value and the general relativity from Einstein have another value that is basically the double of the prediction from, from the New, Newtonian, Newtonian mechanics. And with this experiment, we, we were able to measure this deflection angle. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it here, but there are some uh, lines here showing the position of the stars behind the sun. And then afterwards you can measure uh, the same position without the sun being there, and then you made the difference, then you got the deflection angle. So they did that and they proved that the value from the general relativity from Einstein was the right one. So it's, it's very interesting that this was confirmed uh, in this experiment in Brazil. And basically these were, were the start of the gravitational lensing as a research field. And I, proud, I am proud that Brazil could make part of this contribution to, to the advance of science. Okay, so now that we know how to identify the clusters, how to measure the distance to them, how to measure the mass, we can finally get cosmology, right? Because uh, to get the cosmology, uh, we have a prediction of the number of, cl of clusters of a given mass that you will see in a given distance. And we call this prediction number counts, number counts of clusters. And this quantity is proportional, uh, number counts n, is proportional to the S8 cosmological parameter. So we, we, if you can measure and determine the number counts of clusters and compare with our model, we can determine the value of S8. But one difficult task to measure the one of these steps here, which is the mass of the clusters, is that we cannot assess the true mass of the clusters. Uh, what we can do is just approximation. As I say, we can use the gravitational lensing to have some idea of the total matter. But we also need some kind of observable quantity that can give us some indication of, on how massive the galaxy cluster is, because you need to put, as I say, you need to a lot of galaxy clusters to measure the weak lensing effect. So we need to put them, group them together, cluster which are more or less the same mass and that are more or less at the same distance. 
And one way that you can do this is to look, for example, for the number of red galaxies in, in the clusters. This quantity we call richness. So if a, if a galaxy cluster have more red galaxies, it's a more rich, consequently a more massive cluster. We can also look to the X-ray luminosity, the luminosity of the gas, and also the stellar content of the galaxy cluster. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is here is kind of create this relation between our observable, that's the richness or the luminosity of the stellar mass, as a function of the weak lensing mass. And we expect this relation to be, to follow this nice line here. This is, would be the ideal word, so no uncertainties. But we perform measurements. Therefore, we have uncertainties and we have this kind of scatter. Also, we our detectors, our telescopes, they have limitations. We cannot observe the very faint galaxy clusters. At some point, we cannot see more uh, the light of faint clusters. And therefore, we have some kind of cut here in the, in the sample of galaxy clusters that we can identify. And then at the end of the day, this is the kind of, uh, relation that we call a calibration of the mass from the galaxy cluster that we need to do. And as I will show later, this is most likely the source is in you know, the step that it is more likely that we are doing something wrong. Uh, we are facing some kind of um, systematic error that we are not taking into account. So to measure, to perform, to identify the galaxy clusters, measure the mass, do this calibration, and gather the cosmology. We need to use data. And as I mentioned to you, there are different surveys who are doing this. I am part of the dark energy survey, what we call the DS for, for short. And basically, this was an astronomical project that imaged the, the sky in the southern. Uh, in the southern sky, we image uh, this region here. And the objectives of the of the S is to measure the expansion of the universe and by analyzing the, the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, the, the survey used different uh, methodologies to do that, different me measurements. We use supernova gravitational lensing, more recently gravitational waves too, but this is just the, to see that there are different probes to measure the same quantity. So, and the region is about 5,000 square degrees that we, we image with a camera that, have, that has 500 me megapixels. And we use five filters to get the redshift, the photometric redshift that I mentioned to you. And you have around 100 million galaxies right now for this project we run for six, six years. We now just analyze, uh, are analyzing the data for the 30 year of the observation and you have 100 millions. By the end, we will have around 500 million millions of galaxies to analyze. And it's just to show a picture that I have the chance to go there and observe for the gas. So that was very fun. But once we observe those galaxies with yes, we what you can do now is to measure the mass of those clusters. And for the first year of data of yes, uh, even smaller area than the total area that area that I just showed to you, we have around sixty thousand clusters that we identify by using that technique of, of looking to the red galaxies in the sky. We then uh, define uh, the richness, we, the number of red galaxies as a, a, the observable quantity. And then we group the galaxy, all these 60,000 galaxy clusters uh, that has more or less the same redshift and more or less the same richness. And then we measure the weak lensing mass. And here are the result uh, the, of this calibration that we have. Here is the weak lensing mass as a function of the richness. And the DS result is this blue one, and and this uh, this area just represent uh, the the error bars that you that you have 
in our measurements. So you can see the S has very precise measurements for the mass in comparison to previous me measurements of galaxy clusters. And another thing that, that it is important to know here is that now you know for each cluster that you know the richness, you'll be able to uh, find out what's the mass of this cluster. And finally, once we know the mass, we can have a prediction of how many clusters we expect to see of a given mass in a given distance, the number counts that I just mentioned. And this, again, it pro is proportional to S8. Here is just a plot very similar to the very first one that I show. And this showed this, the results for, for cosmology for, from the S year one data. And our results are this vertical white line here, dashed white line. And with the arrows represented here by this gray line, gray region here. But as you can see again, the value of S8 that we have is pretty low. And it's very low in comparison to other measurements from other surveys, and even more here from, from the measurements from the, from the CMB in green here. So what's going on there? Did you find out new physics? Or is this a very exciting result? Again, not, not, don't go too fast. Um, it's uh, in, this, uh, in this, the article that we described this result, there is a lot of tests that we did to try to find out if this value here is really true. If this value is true, that would mean that the, the matter agglomerates even less than the project by the lambda CDM. That's the model that uh, currently we accept as the, the, the best model to describe the universe. But our result is in tension with that prediction. And we, we think that, OK, calm down. It must be something that we are not considering in your measurements. And therefore, we believe that this tension between the value that we have right now and the values from the early universe is due to some kind of systematic error that we did not take into account in your measurements. And that's what we are working right now. We are trying to understand what kind of systematic would be responsible to make our value be uh, too low in comparison to the other measurements that we have uh, right now. But it's a hard work, so we need to uh, we need many, many people looking to different aspects of the estimation of the mass, identification of the clusters, to try to find out what's wrong, what we did wrong. So this is still an open question and try to find out what's wrong with those measurements. I mentioned systematics, systematics, systematics. I'm the crazy lady for the systematics, sorry. <laughs> but uh, in the case, in the context of galaxy clusters, there are a bunch of them. I will not talk about all of them. I will just mention here three of them. So you can have some idea of what kind of, what could go wrong when you do uh, these measurements with galaxy clusters. So the first one, if you look in this picture, we have here a representation of a galaxy cluster and the galaxy members of this cluster. But as I mentioned to you, you, you we, we have uncertainties in the estimation of the distance of the galaxies. And what could happen is that instead of saying that this galaxy is here, uh, and it make part of the, the galaxy cluster, we let this galaxy leak to the background, uh, to the background sample. So the galaxy, they are behind the cluster. But what happens that these galaxies do not suffer from the lensing effect, right? So that means that they will dilute or decrease the lensing signal. So this is a kind of contamination. 
And it happens because, as I say, we use photometric redshifts and there might be one cause of that. What we need to do is to find out how much we have to boost the lensing signal that you have to increase the signal to, to, to the level that we get, we are confident that we are reproducing the lensing signal that we would expect for that, for that cluster. Another thing is, another systematic is related to the, to the shape, to the measurement of the shape of the background uh, sources here, the background galaxies, the galaxy behind the cluster. Uh, so the thing is that in the true world, we would have this nice galaxy here and measure the shape. But there is gravitational lensing, so the shape is changed a bit. And besides that, we observe this galaxy in a telescope here on Earth. So we have the atmosphere. And what the atmosphere causes is a kind of blurry, blurry of the image. Besides that, we use detectors, use cameras, right? So then we have um, pixels, we have the image in pixels. And as this is not enough, we, we have noise to the image. So at the end of the day, this is the kind of image that we have to recover the shape of the background galaxy. And as you might see, as you may see, like there is a lot of chance that we are doing something wrong with some of the uh, measurements of this, um, the shape of these background galaxies. So this is another source of possible systematic in your measurements. And another thing that don't, we, we don't have a visualization here, but it's very simple, is just to the fact that we can give a wrong center for a cluster. Uh, we know that there are some clusters, they are colliding, right? And they have, uh, dark matter center from this and uh, this collision cluster they have a dark matter center that is that is different from the from the center that we usually give to to the cluster which is the the brightest galaxy in that cluster so the brightest gal galaxy could could be that it's not following the dark matter center so in this case we say that there are a miscentering of our galaxy cluster and this will make our weak lensing signal also decrease. So we need to uh, find a correction for this miscentering of the galaxy clusters. And as I say, there are other effects that I'm not talking here just for the sake of time. It's just to you to have a, a, some idea of the kind of things that could go wrong when measuring the mass of galaxy clusters. And we are working on that. We know these corrections, but the problem, this is not a problem. The problem is the corrections that we don't know, right? The corrections that we, we need to, to understand better the properties of clusters and apply these corrections. And we are doing this for the third year of the data in yes. And just as a comparison here, for year one, we have around 60,000 clusters. For year three, we will have around 20,000 clusters to perform all measurements. And at the first year, what they say is that first we determine the mass and then use this information together with the counts of the clusters to get cosmology. But we see there's something wrong with this approach. And now for Y3, what we'll be doing is instead of determining the mass, we are not doing that. We are just let, it's like, it's like as you let the mass as a free parameter in your model, we just use it, you just use the, the lensing signal together with the counts. So in only one step, it's like we put all the parameters and vary, vary them all together to try to get uh, our cosmology. And that's the main difference between what we are doing now and what we did before. And of course, we are also looking to different ways that we can get cosmology with clusters, but uh, the, this is uh, other, it's subject for another talk, but basically you are trying to find how to get cosmology in two other different ways to compare with the way that we are doing right now and see if with this you know, three different approach, we can get 
uh, consistency between the cosmological parameters that we have from clusters. Okay, I think that was a lot of information. I hope you can we can have learned uh, something from that. But if you don't, I just have a summary here that you might be interesting. And basically, what what you saw today, what you learned. First, we learned what are God's clusters what they, they are made of, they have dark matter, they have gas, gas, they have stars and galaxies. And we know how to identify galaxy clusters. We just need to look to the red galaxies in the sky that are close to each other. Then we can measure the distance to galaxy clusters by measuring this quantity that, that is the redshift. And finally, we can, use, we can use the gravitational lensing effect to have, to have an estimation of the mass. So we use the light of background galaxy to infer the mass of the foreground galaxy cluster. And by knowing all this information, we can put this together with our projections that we have for the number of cluster of a given mass in a given, given distance to get the cosmology. And if it was just that, we are all set. But as I mentioned to you, we have systematic errors in our measurements that we need to take into account. And we need to perform these measurements with great precision to, to be able to distinguish between the different cosmological models with uh, precision and accuracy. And we are working on that. We are developing the white tree cluster cosmology analysis from DS data. And we expect to have these results, these new results by this summer. So stay tuned. And I hope you have learned something about galaxy clusters. And I think they are very beautiful objects, of course. <laughs> and if you don't want to go into details, but just learn a bit more, you can just uh, follow me on, on, on Twitter. Time to time, I just uh, present some information about galaxy clusters there in a very uh, funny way. It's more fun than a, a presentation, I, I swear. And that's it. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any question that you might have. Thank you very much, Maria, for that fascinating, informative, and very clear presentation and all that information. Uh, we had over 150 viewers uh, for your lecture, which is very exciting for us. And there are a number of questions. Um, I, the first question actually comes from Levi. Levi is going to turn 10 next month and he's really looking forward to this lecture and is fascinated by the field. And he has a hard question for you, which is uh, he'd like to know more uh, and get a better idea about S8, what that means what's the physical meaning of that quantity that has so much impact and is so important to you and also where he can learn more okay uh, yeah so s8 um, you can think about this quantity as something that measure how how the galaxy and the galaxy clusters how the matter in the universe get together so we know that everything who has uh, that has mass has gravity. And gravity is an attractive force, so things will, you know, get together. But um, because, the, uh, because the universe is expanding, right, uh, it, it, doesn't, it might happen that there is some force that are moving things apart, the galaxy and the galaxy clusters. So different models of the universe will give different projections. They will tell how, how the galaxy in this expanding universe will behave, if they will be more clumpy in, in a given region of the sky, or if they will spread more in the sky. So the S8 just give us, give us this, um, like a way to, to know how, how, how is the, the fraction of this, no clumpiness of the universe if they get more close 
um, or more far away from each other. So S8 just uh, behave in the sense of controlling how, how this behavior, at least in simulations, happen. Because you know we have the universe, the, the galaxy and the galaxy clusters, they, they are the way they are. We can just have a model and try to project how, how, how they are, the way they, they are. And S8 is basically this quantity, like the physical meaning is just to measure the clump, clumpiness of the matter in the universe. So, uh, if we draw an analogy to the way people congregate now, imagine people in um, the diag in the middle of campus. Uh, so nowadays, they'd all be six feet apart. Yeah. And in, in in former times, they'd be in, maybe in clumps having conversations and so on. So, which one is a larger S eight? So now we are more far away from each other. So I would say that we are higher value of S eight. So we are more mm -hmm. spread. Okay. Cool. All right, so the next question, I'm not sure I really understand it, but the uh, redshift of light from distant galaxies could be explained by something else. For example, um, time accelerating or maybe physics changing over time, the fundamental constants changing. How are you able to rule out these possibilities or can you? Yeah, I mean, I know there are some exotic other models that, uh, you know, explain or claim to explain that why there's no need for expansion, therefore there will no be you know, this redshift. But one thing is that these models, they need to, to have projections that we can test, right? They can just not say, oh, I, I don't believe this is true because the timing or the, the dark matter behaves in a different way. So we need to prove that. Right? So, and as far as I know, none of these more exotic theories right now uh, are being proving more things than the lambda cdm and that that's that's basically you know the thing behind you you have a theory another theory that explain another way but you need to explain what uh the big bang lambda cdm explains but also you need to explain you need to predict uh stuff so we can say you know yeah you're right your theory is right it, it explains what you see. So it's the best explanation. Next question. Does dark energy cause space to expand in the same way that the expansion of the universe is explained? Or are galaxies pushed away from each other in a different way? Uh, again, I think it's very connected with the other one. It, it's. it's it's something called different from dark energy that we don't know what it is <laughs> causing the, the, the things uh, moving away from each other. Uh, I, I have to confess that I don't know what would be these other explanations. I know there are some, but <laughs> no, I didn't read too much about them. But um, I mostly say that the things they are going far away from each other. But for example, it might happen that they are coming together, right? Because of, of gravity. We know this is happening with Andromeda. Andromeda is, is falling towards the Milky Way. Eventually they will uh, merge because the, the gravitational force of the Milky Way and Andromeda, they, they are now interacting. So there is no way the expansion will, will be able to make the moving far away. So the only possible scenario is that they will just merge together. So they are not going far away from each other, but they are moving uh, towards each other because the gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, our viewers really love the uh, balloon demo, for the expansion of the universe. Uh, that was Monica Wood, who's the head of our demo lab, uh, who did that demonstration. And uh, here's a question, which is in that demo, not only did the wavelength get longer, but the amplitude got larger. So the amplitude represents something. So what what actually happens <laughs> um, to light? Yeah. So that that is just one analogy, right? But I also get uh, confused because you know the the wavelength is in, uh, proportional to the inverse of the frequency. Uh, I I think more about frequency, like the frequency get higher, then the wavelength get 
lower, right? And the frequency would be the, the pitch, which uh, I would understand like the, as the amplitude, right? So uh, I think I don't remember well the question, but you know, so one thing happens to the frequency, uh, inverse thing happened to, to the wavelength. So, you know, they are kind of related. And I think mm -hmm. in, in, the, in that demo, uh, what we want to basically show is that, you know, we start with the you know, one wavelength that was this big. And as the, spa uh, the space expand, it got it grow up this big, right? And this difference is just due to, you know, the universe expand itself. It's not that the, the galax galaxies are moving away from each, other, uh, from each other in a movement, in a proper movement but they are just following the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you, if you were to describe the amount of energy in a given volume in the universe, that would be decreasing with time as the universe expands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's inversely proportional to the wavelength, say of a photon. Okay. And, uh, Dark energy is mysterious to all of us. And maybe you could um, explain a little more why this may not be the right description uh, to think of it in terms of particles that uh, are pushing. Dark energy? Yeah. <laughs> really? What's causing the pressure? Yeah. I, I really don't know. <laughs> like. Dark matter, we can see uh, that, you know, many people believe that it's some kind of exotic particle that we are trying to detect here on Earth with different mm -hmm. experiments. So far, the results are not good. We, can, we do not detect dark matter, right? But for dark energy, mm, I, I don't know. I really don't know what could be. <laughs> if I knew it, I would be work on that to get my Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> but we do know that it does not attract matter the way dark matter does gravitationally. No, yeah, it's exactly the contrary. It has to, a re repulsive uh, force, mm -hmm. right? So it's not made up of something that has mass the way we think of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another question, this is an interesting one, particularly since last week, we had this amazing event of the rover um, landing on Mars. So the question is if, if you uh, sent some probe out or maybe something on the moon and look back at the earth, would you be able to determine the mass of the earth from lensing? Okay, is so if you put something on the moon and look? Yeah, so if you were observing from the moon, some kind of sensor on the moon, you know, put your telescope on the moon and look yeah. at distant galaxies behind the Earth or some light source behind the Earth. Yeah, like the problem here is that, uh, yeah, look to, you know, stars. But, you, you know, you are just really, really close to our star, the sun. So you just imagine the sun here and uh, you are just a small star passing around the, you know, the sun. And also there is something about distance. We will not see, uh, you need to be to certain distance to get the lensing to be more effective. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that's interesting is that this other effect that did not study that much, but it's called micro lensing. Because not only we, we change the shape, but also the bright of the, the brightness of the background galaxy. And one thing that happens is that uh, we are here, and these people do, we are here on Earth, and we look to stars in the Milky Way, and there, there are other stars in the Milky Way more far away than the one that you pick, pick up. And it might be that there is a planet that, like Earth, is around the sun, there are some other planet that is around this star. And the presence, the presence of this uh, planet around this star will change the light curve that you see from, from the, the star that, that we are looking to. And this change, uh, we will see like you have a light that goes like this, and we will see a peak, very uh, characteristic peak in the light. 
So we say that, oh, something passed around this star. That might be a planet. And that's why some people use lensing, not weak or strong, but micro lensing to identify uh, planets. Great. Um, my co-organizer, Roy Clark, has a question, um, which is about the uh, gravity wave telescopes. So LIGO and maybe future ones like LISA. Um, how do they contribute, these data contribute to understanding galaxy clusters? Very good uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's the contrary. Like uh, surveys like the S and uh, in the future LSST and others, we will help together with, with the detection from LIGO. Uh, we will help each other to uh, to get the expansion rate of the universe. For example, uh, H naught. Right now we have measurements from CMB and measurements from strong lensing, time delays, and local universe supernova and cepheid. But there are some problems with those measurements uh, because you know we need to define uh, a referential referential frame going to different layers of distance, and then you add more and more uncertainties in your measurements. And one thing that gravitational waves could help to do is it's a different way to measure the Hubble constant, uh, and I will explain why. Why? When we have a collision of uh, two neutron stars. So then we have gravitational wave and, and LIGO detect that wave. So LIGO know the distance that uh, that event happened, that the, 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 the merge of those objects. So LIGO know the distance. But what we can do is to point all telescopes to that direction and try to see the light of this collision, right? So if you see the light, we will be able to identify exactly which galaxy that event happened. So if you can identify that host galaxy, we can have the redshift information. So then from like we have the redshift and from uh, the distance and from, from the as or the survey, we got the redshift, we have, then we have the velocity. I show in, in some of the, my graphs, there is this relation between the redshift and velocity. And this is the Hubble relation, right? And then you can just plug these two numbers together in the in the, in this equation. Velocity uh, is proportional to some constant, and the the distance. And this is the Hubble law, the way that we can estimate the H naught measurements. And we have done that. In fact, um, there are some articles that did this measurement with yes data and LIGO data. But the thing is that. <laughs> We just have one merge, right? And the uncertainties are really, really big right now. So you see the H naught measurements that show they are nice, they have a value in just a small arrow. Right now with uh, gravitational waves, you have gigantic arrows. <laughs> so for the future, if I hope they solve this question, the Hubble tension next this decade, but if they don't uh, with LIGO and other Gravitation, uh, gravitational wave detectors, we will have more and more uh, neutron stars detections, gravitational wave detections. So we will increase our sample, therefore we will decrease our measurements. And it's a totally uh, independent way to get H naught from the ways that we have now. So that, that's why I'm a bit excited about the gravitational waves and the use of this information with galaxies and perhaps galaxy clusters, maybe you can find a correlation. Maybe this, uh, this kind of event, this merger happened more in this kind of, uh, of galaxy clusters, for example. So it can also be able to make a connection with astrophysics. So yeah, I'm very excited about that. Great. We have uh, two more questions. <clears throat> um, back to dark energy. Um, I think our viewers are still struggling to understand <laughs> a little about this. And the uh, there's a uh, question that, that draws an analogy to light pressure um, and wonders if the name energy is given to this because of its that analogy, or is there another reason that it's called dark energy? Yeah, I mean, I know 
energy, you know, that, that equation from, from Einstein, it's proportional to mass square. That's why, you know, you don't feel to, when I show that pizza plot and I put together with dark matter, conventional matter and dark energy, okay, and then you can think, okay, energy is related to, to matter. So that's why I put these, these things together, right? But I think the question was more like, like In what sense is it energy? Um, I think I would say it, it's more like, um, I think I don't know how to say it, to write down this very well. It's because it's like, it's like this repulsive, repulsive force that mm -hmm. we see, right? And you can make some connection with you know, being a force and then have some kind of energy associated to it. So yeah. if the galaxies are speeding up their energy source, there must be an energy source. Is that what it is? <laughs> uh, but that, you mean they, if they are speeding up? But this is, I mean, this is a, a, a yeah. effect from okay. gravity is not a, <laughs> Let's go to the I, last question, <laughs> which yeah. is, um, which is about uh, your your data set, I guess. So you rely on these clusters with the red, and you're using the red elliptical galaxies because understand them. Are there galaxy clusters that um, that don't include mostly red ellipticals, and can you make use of those? If, um... I would love to see those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is what we would call a blue cluster, right? Because uh, the galaxy are most mostly red. But we also have some blue galaxies. Blue galaxy, galaxy can think of galaxies that still forming stars. So uh, you would be able to see those if you go more like far away in redshift, like to higher redshift, because there you still have this star formation in, in the cluster, right? So you would have uh, a larger fraction of blue galaxies uh, making part of the cluster. And so far, we have not identified yet this kind of blue clusters, blue cluster, but it might be possible. <laughs> I'll be happy to see this happen. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again, Maria, for again this fascinating, uh, great lecture, and also for the discussion and, and fielding these questions from our viewers. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And our next lecture is in two weeks. And I think a slide's gonna come up. It's in fact me uh, talking about the physics of basketball. So that will be a change of pace. We're looking forward to that. And uh, I will be working with Monica and the demo lab to tell you uh, about this topic. See you next time. Bye everybody.